Hello, I'm Greg Pollock, and you're watching the 21st episode of the Scaling Rail Screencast series, sponsored by New Relic. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at a couple Ruby and Rails libraries and one service that can help your Rails application scale. First up, we're going to be taking a look at Rubber by Matthew Conway. Rubber is a Capistrano Rails plugin that makes it really easy to deploy your Rails application to EC2 and manage it and even scale it in a cluster. So the first step once we install the plugin is to run the vulcanize command. So we basically specify what components we want inside of our EC2 instances, whether it's Apache, Cruise Control, HA Proxy, etc., etc. We can also have these templates, like for instance, um, Rubber comes with complete passenger MySQL cluster. And what that gives us is these components here. If we wanted additional components, we could then specify if we wanted Sphinx. Or we can even create our own custom templates. Now if we ran this command at the top of the screen, that would generate a Rubber directory inside of our configuration directory, which has the following files and directories. This is made up, first, of deploy information. These are the Capistrano tasks for our deployment. And then we've got some configuration YAML files. These basically detail the configuration of these different components when we deploy them. If we took a look inside the role directory inside the rubber directory, we would start to see configuration files that look familiar. So as you can see, here's the uh, MySQL configuration files. If we looked inside the my.cnf file, we would see that at the top of this file, this is basically ERB. So it's grabbing data out of the YAML files, which correspond with the data directory, log directory, and the path, which is where this file goes in the server. And then it's setting that information, um, which is configuring MySQL on this part of our cluster. Once we've generated these configuration files and set our EC2 credentials, we can then start running Capistrano commands. So what these commands are doing is they're actually instantiating EC2 instances, configuring them, and deploying them. Right? What does this look like? Well, basically deploys this awesome cluster you see right here. We've got HA proxy, which goes to two passengers, which goes to a MySQL master server, which also has replication going on to a MySQL slave. Pretty cool. At this point, you might be wondering, well, why is Rubber better than any of the other options out there that also allow me to deploy to the cloud? Well, there's a couple really neat features that Rubber comes with. First of all, it has dynamic DNS updates, right? So if you do a, another deployment with new EC2 instances, you can have it automatically update your DNS to these new set of servers. It also has built-in backups. So you might have seen with that uh, MySQL configuration we looked at, that also had a cron tab, which schedules backups of our database. It's also very easy to do staging with this sort of configuration because since we have these components all configured, we can either deploy them all separately on separate boxes or we can have a staging server which has all of the components on one box. That's kind of neat though because that means our staging server has the exact same configuration as the rest of our cluster. I was talking to the author of Rubber, and he was telling me because it's so easy for them to deploy staging servers, um, each developer can very easily create their own staging server, especially if they want to show off what they're working on. Create a staging server, show it off, bring it down. Next reason why Rubber is great is it has Monit built in. Monit is basically monitoring for all of your different uh, processes on your servers. So for instance, Monit might be observing um, MySQL or Passenger, and if it notices that it's consuming too much memory or it goes down, it's going to automatically restart that. Rubber also comes with Moonin built in, which is continuously collecting statistics on the health of all of your different components on your cluster. It gives you an admin box you can log into and see how your servers are doing, whether they're, you know, using all their CPU usage, whether they're maxing out, so you can quickly diagnose problems. So there you have the Rubber library. One reason why I really dig Rubber is that it keeps deployment a first class citizen. All of your configuration to deploy to the cloud sits right there in your Rails application in source control, right? Just feels good to have it right there at your fingertips. Secondly, Rubber is of course scalable by default. Because you have all the configuration in there, it's really easy to say, you know, add a couple more application servers if you need to. Next up, we're going to take a look at Cloud Crowd made by the guys at Document Cloud, which allows you to manage parallel processing through background jobs. 
The guys over at Document Cloud are creating a web application that will allow you to upload any sort of large documents, whether they're PDFs or otherwise, and make them viewable on the web and searchable. So one of the problems they had to solve was how do they really quickly, once you upload a PDF, parse through that and get that online. Right. So how would they solve that? Maybe it looks something like this, where they take that PDF document, they split it off into small pieces, give that to a couple background workers, which will then take each of those sets of pages, convert them into different size images, parse out the text, and at the very end of that process, combine all these different piece, you know, pages from everywhere together back into a single document and publish that back online. So they solve this by implementing Cloud Crowd. The anatomy of a Cloud Crowd application might look something like this. So here's our web application. Once a PDF comes in, we might submit that to a central server. That central server, of course, is going to have a work queue or a database to keep track of all the jobs that are coming in that need to be done. Once a, they want to start working on the jobs, they're going to submit that job to what we're going to call a node. Each node could represent, in this case, a separate server. Each of those nodes are going to have workers or processes because remember um, you know if one of these is a single computer it might have multiple CPUs in order to fully take advantage of all the CPUs there needs to be multiple processes running once that node completes the job it might save those files to S3 and signify to the central server that it's complete that central server might tell our web application that it's complete that web app might then go fetch the data from S3 so that's the anatomy of a cloud crowd cluster. So let's go ahead and jump right into a screencast so you can see it in action. So first up, we're going to go ahead and generate the skeleton of a cloud crowd application. So we've got our MyTest directory. Um, some of the files that get generated for us, we've got a config.ru, which you might recognize as a rack file. So we can run our central server. Inside our config.yaml, we can, can have a couple items we can configure, like our central server, the max number of workers each of our nodes can spawn, and uh, the storage mechanism we want to use. We can use S3 or, you know, for development mode, let's use the file system. We also need to specify database information. We can use MySQL here, or I'm just going to use uh, SQLite because, you know, this is just a demo. So once we have that configured, we can then um, create the tables we need in our database. So we've got a jobs table. Um, node records and work units. And from there, we can start up our central job server. Cool. And we can load this up in our browser and we get this awesome web interface, which tells us exactly what jobs we're working on. So right now, we don't have any nodes. Um, we don't have any work units in our queue and we don't have any jobs. But as you can see here, this is actually doing polling. So we can see exactly what's happening inside of our central server. It also shows us active nodes and workers down here at the bottom. So um, let's go ahead and start up a node, you know, somebody that can do some work. So we simply do crowd node. Cool. And now if we check back with our central server, we can see, oh yeah, there it is. Now we have one node that can do some work for us. But what work can we have it do? Well, if we take a look at the uh, skeleton of our Crowd Cloud application, we can have some, we have some default stuff in here. We've got graphics magic, process PDFs, or we can do a word count. Let's do a word count. Inside this app, you can see that we have a process method. This calls WC, which is word count, and we give it an input path, which can be a URL to words we want to count. And then down below, we've got a merge method, which is going to combine all the counts from all the different things we want it counting into a sum which gets returned. And as you can notice right there, I put sleep five so that this process takes a little bit longer than it should. To trigger the action on our central server, we simply do a REST request. So we call the jobs URL. We give it the name of the action we want to call, and we send it inputs. In this case, I'm going to have it count the words from all of these different Shakespeare plays. <laughs> cool. So now we can just run that script. And now if we take a look at the central server, we can say, hey, look, we've got five different nodes running. We can see exactly what they're doing. They're working on our process. If we take a look at the top of the page, we can see the progress. Now we're 41% complete. 
If we take a look at the work units in the queue, we can see we started out with uh, 23 work units. That's because we had 23 books. And we can see the progress. We've got one job in the queue. And now we're done. Well, I happen to know that this job is job number one. So if I do a get request to jobs slash one, I can get information about the progress of this job. Here I can see it succeeded, 100% complete, it took 21 seconds, and there's 558,804 words in all of those Shakespeare plays. <laughs> Two of the reasons I really did Cloud Crowd is that it's simple, and the guys who created it wanted to make sure it was very hackable. It's less than 2,000 lines of code, which means if I need to customize this in some way, make it do something slightly different, I'm not going to be intimidated when I start looking into the code under the covers. So I'd be more likely to use something like Cloud Crowd over something like Gearman or MapReduce or Hadoop because I know that I can, you know, dive into the code if I need to and, and tweak it if I need to. So it's going to be more maintainable in the long run. Before we get to our last library, I'm afraid it's time for a rant. <laughs> it's been a while since we've ranted. <laughs> We're going to rant about two problems that I have with email and Rails applications. First up, mailing lists. Inevitably, when you're working on a Rails app, at some point the client's going to ask for mailing lists, right? This is where you've got, you know, maybe you've got a newsletter you need people to opt into. Uh, maybe you've got like a discount newsletter people are going to opt into. And so you've got to deal with whitelists. You've got to deal with unsubscribing people and blacklists. You've got to implement some sort of way your client can send out mass emails and worry about that traffic. And it can quickly become a headache. The second thing I want to rant about is client changes, right? So here we've got a project where I've got all of my ERB HTML email templates right there on my application. And every time a client wants to make the smallest change, they're going to have to bug me, you know, submit a ticket, and I'm going to go in and have to make, you know, grammar changes, you know, in addition, you know, spelling error changes and, and whatever. And it's just annoying. Luckily, I've got some good news for you. There's definitely hope, and there's actually a web service that can solve these problems for you. Um, you know, there's, there's a couple web services that can solve some of these problems for you, but the one I'm going to focus on is Mad Mimi because they're doing it right, really right. And they're a Rails application, so I'm going to show a little favoritism. First up, Mad Mimi's got a great API. So if I want to subscribe a user to a mailing list, well, I simply need to do a REST call, specify the name of the list, and their email. And I can subscribe them using a REST call. Um, besides having the ability to add a user, I can unsubscribe a user from a mailing list. And I can also do this in bulk if we've got users subscribing to multiple mailing lists. So now that I've moved my mailing list into Mad Mimi, now when my client wants to send out an email, well, they just go into Mad Mimi, use their very user-friendly interface to create email campaigns, send those out using the bandwidth I know they have, <laughs> and it also does email tracking so the client can see, you know, how many people open the email. So the API solves our first problem of having to deal with mailing lists, but what about client changes when they want changes to those email templates that are inside of our Rails app? Well, here's what we can do. We can take those templates, and what we can do is actually put them inside of Mad Mimi. We can recreate them as promotions. That's what they call, you know, email templates inside of Mad Mimi. They call them promotions. You know, all the emails we can create here, including even like the welcome email to our website. So how do we get that to send inside of our Rails app? Well, that's where the Mad Mimi gem comes in. The Mad Mimi gem allows us to write code that looks like this. So here we've got our user mailer, and here it's from Mad Mimi mailer instead of, you know, action mailer. We can specify recipients, the from, just like normal. Here's where we specify the promotion name. So that's the name of the promotion inside Mad Mimi. And then we have the subject. To send this email, we simply call delivered new account notification. That's all there is to it. It goes to Mad Mimi and says, okay, go ahead and send out this new user email. That's done. All of a sudden, we've offloaded all of our emails to a web service. You know, kind of a good thing if we you know, want to think about scaling our Rails app. Um, but that, that leads us to the next problem. Uh, what if inside of my emails, I've got dynamic data, right? If I want to put the user's name, email, and account number, 
how do I do that if I've got templates on someone else's server? Well, we can do that by simply doing this. We use the body keyword, and inside of a hash, we put the data, which then gets sent to Mad Mimi, and populated inside of that promotion, sent to the user. It's just that easy. So now because of this change, both the client and the developers are much happier because when the client needs to make any changes to emails, well, they just go straight into Mad Mimi, where they can find all the email templates, well here they're called promotions, and edit them on the fly. So as you might have realized, I implemented this in one of my production applications. A few weeks later, something really cool happened. The client had a new feature. They came to me and said, okay, when a user does this, I want this email to get sent out. Oh, and I've already created the email I want to get sent out. It's already in Mad Mimi. So all you have to do is hook it up to Rails. I was like, damn, that's awesome. <laughs> all I have to do is go into Rails and hook that up to that email they already created for me, and that's it. So basically the client did that work for me of creating that email template. Pretty cool. So. That's Mad Mimi. Again, I'm sure there's probably other web services out there that may do this in the future, but Mad Mimi is doing it the right way right now, and they're a Rails app, which, you know, allows me to give a little bit of favoritism. Well, looks like we finished our tour through Rubber, Cloud Crowd, and Mad Mimi. If you want to keep up to date with new Ruby and Rails libraries that'll help you scale, be sure you subscribe to the Ruby 5 podcast. Remember, this is my twice weekly podcast where we go over all the news in the Ruby and Rails community. And be sure that you've got new Relic RPM installed in your production server so you know what your server's doing while you're sleeping and you can keep an eye out. Thanks for watching this screencast. I'll see you later.